Welcome back, everyone, to the Heathen Journal, Volume 1, Women in Heathenry, What We Find Beyond the Literature, by Jill. Okay. Many times, the fictitious tales of the sagas conflict with the surviving legal codes and archaeological evidence, giving us a hazy picture of reality for, for women in historical heathenry. This does not mean we put away the stories of heroic women and erase them from our lore. Just because there is a conflict between the sagas, legal codes, and archaeological evidence does not mean we ignore the literature. None of this should s imply that women like those in the w stories did not exist, because they very likely did. We just have to keep in mind that well-behaved women seldom make history. Which means we have to have been left with little evidence of the ones who follow the rules. In the Reconstructionist approach to heathenry, if we do not attempt to look at multiple sto sources in a story, we are creating gaps in knowledge that may not exist. Fuck. Okay. In order to gain a full understanding of why our ancestors practiced things in the manner they do, that they did, then we must examine the guts as well as the glory, especially in a subject that is vaguely scrawled across the pages of, of the past like women's roles. This is evidence of gender roles in ritual, historic in ritual historically, and without the examination of those rituals or the context in which we find them, then we leave our leaving gaps in meaning, which defeats the purpose of what the movement in is attempting to accomplish. We cannot confine confine ourselves to the sagas and eddas, where we have where we miss p massive amounts of mat material lending us insight to marriage, birthing rights, daily roles, and gender roles. They may or may not have affected the holy. Expanding past the literature gives us a wider insight into daily realities. While some of the, those realities are hard to stomach by modern heathens, they are realities all the same. One of those realities is, in some ways, Christianity did bring what would modernly be labeled as freedoms to the North that did not exist before. In Norway and Iceland, a woman did not have a, ch a voice in her marriage. It was arranged by her father and the bridegroom and his family, and indeed, and indeed, she may never lay eyes on him until the wedding day. Christianity brought the right and indeed demanded the bride's consent, or more specifically, the absence of no, in order for a marriage to take place. There was also no minimum, minimum age to marry, and we can see an example of this in the Gragas as to the special provisions to granted for women widowed and engaged under the age of 16. Women were defined by their marital status as a maiden, wife, or widow, opposed to men who uh, had no status designated to them through lack marriage or lack of. To, to dismiss this as irrelevant is to deny basic household dynamics and the vision of power that, did that dictated rituals, such as the right to the life of a child and the naming of those who that survived. By, by combining the literature with the legal codes, we can get a bigger picture of what the picture of the right to life, which in turn lets us piece together assumptions of naming rituals. Gleese outlines the ritual of leaving the child on the floor until the father picks up the child, acknowledges it as his own, and names it. Unless he does, the child will be exposed. Taking the right to choose a child's life from the woman, Norwegian law states that every child must have a father and both Norwegian and, and Icelandic law allowed for the torture of a pregnant woman in order to gain the name of the father or demanding the name from the door while the woman was in labor. Working under the fair and supported assumption of, that the church did not outlaw most practices that did not go directly against early Christianity doctrine and our knowledge of early Christian doctrine, we may have a good idea of what of what was pagan practice and what was Christian influence. What the church attempted to take over was the right to decide life, not the father, which in the end changed very little in how they practiced their births. By accepting the roles of and rights of women, we have a fair understanding, understanding to an important rite of passage, a name. None of this ha is to say that women had no rights or were uh, utterly passive. The Norse Iceland and the Anglo-Saxon clung to the right to divorce so fiercely, the church stopped trying to, out to abolish it and simply tried to control it, because the church didn't believe in divorce at the time, but the Norse and Anglo-Saxons did. 
The legal codes are peppered with detailed inheritance and divorce laws outlining what a woman has held the right to as her own. For example, in the laws of Ethelbert and Anglo-Saxon law, a woman could leave with child and still maintain half of the property. In the sagas, we can see where women maintain their, their entire dowry, giving us an instance where the sagas match up with believable reality. A, wo a woman could not complete her divorce without a man, but she could not speak at the thing. But she could initiate one with nothing more than a witness before the era of the church came into play, and not much more even after the church took over, took up supervision of divorce. The Gregus outlined the many reasons that a person could get a divorce, making it still relatively easy to obtain, and the ability for a woman to take her property with her and back to the, her family made it a valuable threat. What we have is undeniable evidence that shows women were considerably women were considered socially unequal by our terms, but did, but did, but that did not mean that they were not extremely liberated compared to the Greeks or Romans, or that they held no sense of balance at all. So what that says is that by our standards they weren't equal, but Norse women were equal compared to other cultures at that time, because the Romans and Greeks and even the Egyptians treated the women like garbage. <laughs> What we would consider a gender divide in labor, our, s our ancestors did not. Again, supporting the importance of context. For example, in a Denmark cemetery of 320 graves, 85 were male, 73 were females, and 162 cannot be determined through bones or grave goods. What they found was there was a higher percentage of objects such as weapons and riding equipment in the male graves and arm, arm rings and spindle whorls in women's graves. But that does not mean that all named objects were not found in the both male and female graves. Only a higher percentage of a specific, specific item were as for a specific gender. For example, cooking equipment was found in both male and female, but in 26% of the graves, opposed to 16% in male graves, and agricultural equipment was found in 50% of female graves, opposed to 36% of male graves, there was a difference in the specific type of equipment per gender. Women were also found buried with weights and balances, a strong indicator that women were allowed to participate in trade. Women were also able to own and sell property in some cases. She was also allowed to inherit property, and according to the Gregus inheritance section, could come directly into her inheritance, even before the age of 16, which was the legal age for a male. Generally, women were married and their husband gained control of that property, or her male guardian, but she maintained ownership of it. While none of this remotely supports modern equality, it does not support total submission either. There are some realms that belong to women alone, alone such as cup-bearing and liquor, and, liquor, and liquor rituals and incitement of wetting. When we look at the sources of these topics, we can s see a clear formula for these rituals and the fact that it was left solely to women to fulfill these roles in a socio-religious context that seems to be largely ignored in heathenry. It is not that there is no value in literature, because there, because that would be blatantly untrue and damaging. That it, that is only to say that it cannot and should not be taken at face value. These amazing, these amazing examples of poetry and lore were not meant to be historical documents, but as pieces of art and entertainment, with small glimpses into the world the writer wished to convey. These are stories of heroes and nobility, which is not reflected in, in or representative of the common man or in real life. The literature plies us with stories of queens, warriors, and valkyries of incredible worth and power that rule the world in glory and fame. However, when we examine the literature alone, we miss vital pieces to the puzzle that was that has been left to us. The high ratio of men to women in the literature gives us an even smaller window to view women in uh, to view women in historical heathenry, and that it that is before we pick up the part of heavy Christian influence and additions. That is not to say we did not have a great deal of mater material to learn from, including the, r the literary sources. It only says that in order to gain a real grasp of our ancestral sisters, we must broaden our scope significantly in order to see the dynamics that influence rituals and rights of women in historical heathenry, and, and in turn get, get a better grasp of on ritual and life itself. Okay, that is it.
Now, next chapter will be Some Animal Imagery in Anglian Heathenry by John Wills. But, I'm going to get off for the day. And let me know what you think in the comments about, you know, this, ch this series so far. And what are your thoughts about heathen women or pagan women or just whatever. Let me know.